Thanks. Thank you, Leonard. And, and uh, thank you, Robert, for organizing uh, this, this uh, event. And it's wonderful. Um, next. So, um, you know, I'm Steve McMenamin, and I'm putting this slide up here um, because what we are doing, and you'll see the Bruce Museum um, at the top of this document, what we, what we have done at the Greenwich Roundtable for the last 25 years is taken a best practices approach to long-term investing. In other words, we, we were looking for uh, ideas wherever they came from. We, we tried not to take an ideological perspective, um, more of a scientific approach, and I, uh, that's why I like your title so much, is that we wanted to, to take uh, the best ideas wherever they came from. And we literally went all around the world inviting um, the, the, some of the best wealth creators to the Bruce Museum to share their secrets. Uh, and, and we were charged with um, publishing a series of best practice documents. This, I, I chose this particular slide um, because uh, it, it, we're trying to incorporate, or here we tried to incorporate uh, the best of the old school and the best of the new school. The old school being conventional investing and the new school alternative investments. And that, that's what we've done here at Versailles Farm. Next. So as, as you may know, um, we, we uh, at one point owned Versailles restaurant. We, we bought it out of bankruptcy. We renovated it and um, um, we, we got four stars by the New York Times. And, and that, that was interesting. So we know a little bit about food next. Uh, but but in, in our research uh, for the restaurant, we went literally all over the world looking at small scale agricultural practices uh, fennel on the left there in Italy, taro on the right there in Hawaii, next. Uh, rice in Vietnam, um, here is a cover crop in um, um, Nepal near Annapurna. There's a picture of my wife, Ingrid, as we're, we're trying to hike up um, along the Annapurna circuit, next. And um, a farmer's market in India. Um, here I'm helping, I'm not really helping that much, but I'm, I'm weeding a rice paddy in India. Next. Uh, and there's Ingrid um, uh, next to a, a large combine harvesting winter, uh, winter wheat in the Finger Lakes. And uh, on the right is um, looking at a farmer uh, tilling the soil in Bhutan, uh, very much like Connecticut here. It's rocky, it's inhospitable, it's very cold, and um, they, they, they pretty much have the same challenges that, that we do here in Connecticut. Next. Uh, m most impressive to us were the small scale agricultural techniques that we saw in Japan. Um, all the small tools, the small machines, the different varieties of seeds that we simply have not seen over here. And it's every time we go to Japan, we're constantly amazed. We're also seeing a lot of people uh, like ourselves, we're, we're 60 somethings now. And most of the people we saw tilling the fields uh, on a very small scale basis were our age and they work very long days and they literally grow most of the food for Japan. Next. So our, our plot here in the back country is a, um, uh, an abandoned railroad. It was a, um, a, supposed to be an agricultural cooperative railroad. It was um, conceived in 1910. Uh, it was viewed as um, being able to feed the United Nations, or, or excuse me, uh, cut or, or, or deliver uh, people to the United Nations when it was proposed in 1945 on Yale University's property at Yale Farms, as you may see there. Uh, that uh, proposal for the United Nations was defeated in 1945, and the plans for the railroad were abandoned. And, and, but you see this, um, the swath that was cut through the back country now became, you know, really, um, you know, what do we do with this or what does, what does one do with that? Um, if, if you notice in the back country of Greenwich, um, all these low slung stone walls, and that told us something about the land that it was, um, it was all farms uh, before we started growing houses here in town. Um, people were growing food. We were the breadbasket for New York City starting in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, and early 1900s. Next. 
So in uh, 2013, um, we bought 56 Locust Road out of bankruptcy. We, um, we tore the house down and the first thing we did was plant a cover crop next. Um, but, but if, if, you know, we don't think of ourselves as a farm or, or you know, we, we think of ourselves as a, you know, good old fashioned New England family farm. And it's characterized by, you know, very short growing seasons. We have rocky soil, we have rich soil. As Jack said, when the glacier retreated uh, back uh, 10,000 years ago, it dropped, in our case, about 200 feet of beautiful black biomass uh, in the place. Um, we work the land. Uh, we're self-sufficient, um, and in the New England uh, tradition, we had no slaves. Uh, we had no, um, <laughs> they had no slaves. We had no tractor. They had no tractor, and everyone worked. So you have a mother, a father, and two children that could literally um, work a piece of land like ours and um, be able to feed themselves and others. Next. Um, our, our farming method, our growing method, uh, we think of ourselves as growers, not necessarily as farmers, but is characterized by 30 inch raised beds. Each bed is about nine inches high. We have 12 inch aisles. Uh, each of our 190 beds are 50 feet long. Again, we have no tractor. We do everything by hand. Um, we select our crops based on their short days to maturity. In other words, um, you know, how, how fast can we grow things? Um, you know, and in some cases we're turning beds over um, five to six times a season. We try to preserve the soil web and even build the soil web. We use organic techniques. Um, even we're not organically certified and we don't wanna be. Uh, we do do complementary plantings in some cases. In other words, we're, you know, each bed is sharing two plants that are symbiotic with one another. Uh, and we let the land dictate the terms. In other words, we're trying to play the hand of cards that were dealt. Next. Um, here we have it uh, on the left there, you see that beautiful black biomass uh, that I talked about earlier. Uh, on, on the right, as we, uh, you know, we work the field in the spring, uh, this, is what, uh, this is what we're growing in the spring, rocks. Next. Uh, we have a very short growing season here. Uh, here it's uh, May 9th and um, it was snowing on May 9th. So uh, we have an agricultural wool that's on top of all the crops. We just planted about 70,000 plugs. And, um, you know, fortunately there's this, there's this ag wool that we, uh, we got to use, which literally saved the crop. Next. And next again. So again, we're dealing, you know, we are trying to play the hand of cards that were dealt and we were dealt with a, a lot of wetlands. Um, if you can see the map on the left, that purplish shows the wetlands that we, um, we are working in. Um, we um, fought very hard for a wetlands exemption. We have, a, we have an aggressive regulator here um, that we, uh, we negotiated with. And we found in our travels to Japan that shiitake mushrooms um, grow very, very well in the wetlands. And um, we think we're the largest grower of shiitake in the state of Connecticut. We have 22 different species of shiitake and they're simply delicious. Next. Uh, um, we have no tractor. Uh, everything is harvested by hand. Next. Um, and people say, you know, this must be your passion. Well, it's not really my passion, but in its, I'd say it's a lot of hard work. We work seven days a week. Uh, this past growing season, we worked over 225 days without a break. Uh, there's a picture of Ingrid on the right. She was harvesting lavender in 90 degree heat. And um, it's really hard work. Next. Uh, thank God for our interns. Um, they're, they're so into it. Uh, they, they work very, very hard. Uh, we usually have about three interns on, on staff at any given point in time, and they're just wonderful. They're, they're so into it. They're, you know, they, they just jump into every opportunity. They're learning a lot, and, and we love watching them, them grow. Next. Uh, again, I mentioned we use organic techniques. On the right there, you see we have a cover crop of vetch, clover, and winter rye. And on the left there, we're using um, um, some, uh, something called EM1, a microbial inoculant. We use that to charge um, our biochar. We put it into our drip irrigation system, and sometimes um, I do a foliar, foliar feed with it. Next. 
Um, and we're really um, proud of what we're doing um, with the pollinators. There you, you know, we see the, 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 the Italian honeybees that we have and these are Ingrid's bees and you see the queen there with the dot on her, her head. But I think one of the secrets to um, our, you know, our success, if you can call it that, is Ingrid's skill as a beekeeper, uh, constantly learning, constantly observing, constantly adjusting, constantly monitoring her, um, her hives, but also uh, the, the wildflowers. So, you know, we've observed it's not really the pesticides that are, are um, um, contributing to colony collapse or, or to the you know, to the death of, of hives, but it's simply the lack of, of nectar and, and, and wildflowers, especially here in the back country that people just, you know, sort of throw up a, a hive, not thinking that, you know, the next door neighbor has a hive and it takes um, about 55,000, excuse me, 2 million pollen visits by 55,000 bees to produce one pound of honey. So as you can imagine, you know, each hive holds about 20,000 bees the number of pollen visits and there, there's just simply not enough flowers and not enough nectar through most of the season to support that um, a hive. Next. So again, we're, we're characterized by high turnover. Here's a bed that we just seeded. In the summertime, we'll seed a bed and it takes about three to four days for germination. And then in some cases, especially when the soil's nice and warm, we'll be harvesting anywhere from 28 days to 40 days after we've seeded and then we're turning the bed over. Next. Uh, we have 52 crops. Uh, it's a lot. Each one has its own personality and we're constantly harvesting. I think about 60 to 70% of our activity is in harvest. Next. Uh, we're obsessed with sanitation, as you can imagine, even before COVID. Um, I almost died of sepsis in Fiji in 1999. Um, and I'm really, you know, sensitive to pathogens, human pathogens. And we were obsessed with sanitation, especially at the restaurant where, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with the public and it's so easy. I'm sort of like a canary in the coal mine. If there are any pathogens on any food, you know, I find out right away. So we, we use something called Sanidate. It's a combination of uh, periacidic acid and hydrogen peroxide that we, um, we use to wash everything. Um, we have some very simple rules at the farm stand and you see our farm protocols. It's not, you know, they're easy to follow and you know, it's not, nothing to get upset about. And so that's why at the bottom we say inhale, exhale, breathe and relax. Next. Um, Post-harvest is very, very important here. We're, uh, we're bubbling um, some Swiss chard here. It's what we call a kill wash. And um, the bubbling, the gentle bubbling um, doesn't bruise the leaf. Um, we do a lot, you know, in harvest, they will do anywhere from 20 to 30 different kinds of greens uh, on a day. On the right, even though we don't like to use plastic, here's a technique we picked up in Japan and it, it really keeps our hygiene chain intact. These bags are micro perforated bags. Most of the stuff that we're cutting, all of the stuff we're cutting for that matter, is still breathing, it's still alive, it's still respirating. We're trying to, we're trying to minimize transpiration. We're trying to in, encourage these plants to keep breathing uh, before uh, they go onto your plate. And um, we also keep uh, the cold chain alive by putting everything into an ice bath. Next. Um, and if, you know, it's all about marketing, I'm sorry. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of producers, a lot of growers don't like the marketing aspect of it, but, you know, we sell direct to the public. Um, on the left, we had a little postcard that we sent to 70,000 households in a five mile radius around the farm. And that's all we did. And, you know, we, we generated enough demand. Um, we also find that so we're growing some very specialized crops and new things and people just don't know what to do with it. So anytime we have something new, we try to put a recipe out in front to give people ideas and that, that helps us have no waste. Next. Um, we also have a little rule here. Sometimes we can't um, put everything in plastic. And we, again, we picked this up in Japan, that little sign there says, you touch, you buy. Uh, that's been very effective. So we can keep our, um, our hygiene chain. If somebody touches it, um, Ingrid gently reminds it that they've just bought it. Uh, so it's a, 
it's always interesting. Uh, and on the right, uh, Peter Sutton, the former executive director uh, and CEO of the Bruce Museum, helped us pick out our logo. That, that little wreath there is the um, uh, wreath of roses. It was painted for Marie Antoinette uh, by Pierre Joseph Retherte. We have a patent on it and that's our, that's our logo. Next. Uh, so our summer stand, we're open uh, only on the weekends uh, from nine to five. Um, and we do about 60% of our revenue uh, from the summer stand, next. Uh, then we do about another 40% of our revenue from the country clubs. We serve four clubs. Um, we have a great relationship with them. I really prize our relationship with the clubs, with the chefs, with the sous chefs. Um, we trade ideas back and forth. Um, they're really quite, they're really quite good. And um, they give me ideas on what to grow. Sometimes uh, maybe too many ideas and then I grow it and I, I have to tell them I, I can't grow this anymore because, you know, I'm not either it just doesn't take to our soil or no one's buying it. So I have to discontinue it. But it's they all understand. And they're so, you know, our, the relationship I have with the chefs are they say to me, Steve, whatever you're producing too much of or whatever you have that no one's bought on the weekend, just deliver it to us. And then I, I, I can't tell you as a farmer how much pressure that takes off of us. Next. Uh, so as Jack said, it's all about the soil. It truly is all about the soil. Um, here, um, you know, in, in our case, we, um, we are adding sand to the soil there on the left. Um, we're trying to create more porosity in the soil to have these beds shed the water. You can, you can always add moisture, you can't remove it. Um, so I want to, I want to get us to a point where, you know, we, we can, we can remove it quite easily. We're also making something there on the right called biochar. Um, we make our own charcoal, um, here we're charging it, we're inoculating it, uh, and, um, that means we're adding, uh, microbes and we're adding, um, nutrients to the, to the charcoal. We're trying to create something called agua preta soil and, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later how that works. Next. Um, and here's, here's one of the beds that's getting ready to be seeded. Uh, there's a soil moisture sensor right there. Um, one thing I learned from one of the country clubs, the green superintendent, Jeff Scott, over at Tamarack is, is spoon feeding. Um, I, I'm, one of the mistakes um, I made, we made when we first got it was putting our irrigation on a timer and you know, just blindly irrigating uh, at a certain time for a certain amount of time just was not, was not right. And we, you know, the soil was hanging on to the moisture too much. We had crops rotting in the field. And um, you know, I learned from Jeff to spoon feed. So that soil moisture sensor, it's, you know, it's run on an app on my iPhone. Um, and then I can turn on the irrigation from an app on my iPhone and I, I get the soil to the proper um, you know, level of moisture that I need. Also, we fertigate, or in other words, we fertilize through that, um, through that drip uh, system. Next. Uh, and we're making something called biochar, as I mentioned earlier. There's a picture on the left there of our new um, uh, retort kiln. I had it fabricated in England. And um, you know, quite simply, we're pyrolyzing all the wonderful wood that we have here in the backcountry. We have maybe too much wood um, you know, first we're chipping it up and then we're selling it for firewood. But um, right now we, we found something really cool and that's making charcoal. We charge it, we inoculate it. The uh, photograph on the right are, are two beds of mescaline lettuce. Uh, that one bed you see there on the right is uh, without biochar. There's nothing wrong with it. It's still delicious and nutrient dense and whatever. Uh, but look at that bed on the left. That's the bed with biochar. I mean, look at the plant vitality. It's amazing. Um, so I, I can't say enough about it. And this was our first year working with biochar and you know, it was an experiment and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say it worked. Next. Uh, we have some unique crops. In May, we harvest fiddlehead ferns. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of ferns on our property. Uh, and then on the right, we have, it's a new, uh, a new product this year. It's called plant juice. So at, we have no waste at the end of our harvest, anything that's uh, ugly or, you know, not fit for, um, sale because people really like to see, you know, a perfect, um, cabbage or something like that. Um, 
we just we just juice it. So each of these jars contains anywhere from you know seven to eight plants that are juiced. It's a it's a bitter blend. Um, it's it's an acquired taste. It's very difficult to <laughs> to get over, especially as us as Americans, we're not used to the bitter. But you know the bitter is just digestive magic. So this is a this is a cleanse. It's an energy drink. Um, and uh, you know, I, I do something called intermittent fasting. And so I'll take four ounces of this in the morning and I don't need to eat anything until noontime. So my, di my, my digestive system has had a rest for um, anywhere from 12 to 16 hours. Next. We have some unique crops. There's on the left is activated charcoal. It's a, um, it's a cleanse, um, it's a detox and um, I won't get into it because I could talk forever about it, but it, we just start selling that. And um, on the right there is truffle honey. So, um, you know, we, we Ingrid infuses um, her honey with some truffles and it's, it's this perfect blend of umami and sweet. Next. The best thing about people say is, is your passion? I say, well, you know, it's not really my passion. I do like it. It's, um, you know, it's one of our businesses, but the best part about what we do is, is all the wonderful people who come into the farm stand. I can't say enough. Um, and Ingrid and I just talk about it. You know, after the season's over, we go, Oof, that was really hard. But remember these people, they were so nice. And, and it's sort of self-selecting, <laughs> like all the nicest people come to the farm stand and uh, they're just wonderful. And that, that's, this is really the best part of uh, what we do. Um, next. So if I have any message for you all, especially if you're here in the back country is please, um, as Jack, um, go over to Stone Barns, L look, at, look at their kitchen gardens and um, rip up your lawn. Let's start growing some food. Let's stop getting, stop being in the business of, you know, growing turf and, and all the money and effort and energy that goes into growing grass. And, you know, probably for the same amount of energy and all that, that effort, you can grow food and, and really, and, and start to, to eat really, really well. This is a post from Instagram, um, 6,000 pounds of food per year on just a 10th of an acre in, in urban Los Angeles. This is an extreme example, but um, you know, it, you know it, it can be done. Next. And I wanna thank you. There's, a, there's an overhead shot of um, our little farm uh, in production. As you can see, it's quite intensive. That's just one acre. Uh, we have eight acres, and um, you know, I'll just I'll just stop right there and say thank you. <laughs>